shall bring and joy to the nations when Jesus is King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He is all we need. Voices raised to Jesus, sing to the King. For His returning, we watch and we pray. We will be ready the dawn of that day. We'll join in singing with all the Turn to the person next to you and say, sing to the king. And then y'all be seated. Okay. All right, everybody. This is Jason. And Jason uh, came down a couple of weeks ago saying that he had already given his life to Christ, but he wants to follow in believers' baptism and uh, join our church. And so... Yeah. Uh, that's a great thing. So we're going to baptize him, and no matter what happens the rest of the day, this is going to be a great day. Amen. 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 All right. So, Jason, come on over for your tall feller. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, because you have made a public profession of your faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk the newness of life. Well, I know, but I expect you to over there. So, <laughs> Good morning. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. That's a family of God. I, uh, I had some scriptures I was going to read, and I uh, got sidetracked onto something else. And I think this is uh, pertinent to... Uh, today's world uh, in my life uh, uh, my wife will tell you I watch way too much conservative TV I won't, I won't mention it's ta the station but I watch a lot of stuff and it's uh, it's conservative and uh, I, I watch it too often but it, in, in it I realize that there's this part, point of view and there's that point of view and I like to listen to this I like to surround myself with people that believe that way uh, but we need to surround ourselves with people uh, that are living the Word of God. And what I want to read it today is found in John 15, and I've got a lot of this highlighted and underlined, but out in the column I've got set apart, because that's what we are. We're to, we're to be set apart from the world. And I'm going to start with verse 18, John 15, and I'll read this and see if you guys think you bel uh, fall into this, how good does it feel just to be around people that think this way? Verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me 
before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuteth me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they will have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sin. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fully fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a, without a cause. When the helper comes, whom will I send to you from the Father? That is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify about me. And you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. Th these scriptures really uh, spoke to me. And I, I was sitting there this morning thinking, how good it is to be able to come to this place. It's a reason it's called a sanctuary, because we can come here and find peace, because we have people that are trying to follow God's word and do what he calls us to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you that uh, you provide for us a safe haven where we can come and read about your word and know that you are here. Lord, let us uh, bring honor and glory to you. We thank you that uh, you sacrificed your son Jesus Christ for us and that because of that and our knowledge and fulfillment that uh, we know that you loved us and you sacrificed for us that we can just uh, come together lift you up and sing praises and bring honor and glory to you Lord go with us now through this time elevate uh, our awareness of who you are and what you're doing in our lives guide us and strengthen us these things I pray amen Amen. Thank you, Brother Bob. Stand and sing this great hymn with me. When peace like a river.
with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God Amen y'all be seated start over. So again, good morning. Uh, I'd like to start uh, this week just like we did last week. If there's any men uh, who would like to come to the prayer benches and, and uh, lead our church in prayer, um, just kind of be praying for those. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Um, I'll be reading uh, out of James chapter 5 as those guys come down. I appreciate you. Um, it says, is anyone among you sick? Then you must call for the elders of the church and they're to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another. So that you may be healed. The best part, really. The effective prayer of a righteous man can't accomplish much. Um, so we've got a lot uh, on the prayer list. I was actually uh, expecting a lot fewer people this morning... Uh, the amount of calls that we got uh, of people sick. Um, but So this morning, uh, just be praying for the Cargills. Uh, they were going back down to Texas to pick up his mother. Uh, she's being released from the hospital uh, tomorrow. Uh, so be praying for them. They got to stop a whole lot uh, to try, try to prevent blood clots and that kind of a thing as they're trying to get her home. So again, uh, just be lifting up the Cargills. Uh, Jimmy's son, Miko, uh, last I heard, he's still in the hospital, so be praying for him. Uh, he's still there and, and not doing very well. Um, Teresa Baker's having surgery Tuesday to remove a tumor from her kidney. Bobby Doss is also having a procedure on Monday to remove a tumor from her back. I spoke to Margaret Aiken this week, and she's having surgery on Friday. Um, man, she's a trooper, if you, if you know Margaret. Um, I just love her to death. But she asked for prayer specifically, um, and she's having surgery again this week. Uh, Ruth had proton therapy uh, this last Wednesday. Um, they're going to wait a few weeks before they know exactly how successful that is, but uh, Ruth is another one that's just battling. Uh, we need to, to make sure we're lifting her up in prayer. Um, Sue Wilsey's son and their family are struggling with COVID. I may have overheard her this morning. Maybe they're doing a little bit better, but again, just continue to be in prayer for that family. That kind of brings us um, to the rest of our church. Like I was saying, there's a whole lot of us uh, that are out sick this morning. We received numerous calls um, just of people, not necessarily COVID, but just under the weather, so uh, again, just be lifting all of us up in prayer and encouraging each other as we go through the week. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. Uh, I thank you just for this service. I thank you for this church, uh, the opportunity to be here uh, to bring glory and honor to you. I pray that you would just be with my pastor, that you would ease his, his nerves, his anxiety. Father, it didn't really matter um, because everything he says is coming from you. It's not his words, Father. He can be at ease. That you're going to use your word not RJ's word. I pray, Father, that these ones on our prayer list, that you would be with them, you would bring them comfort uh, and healing. Um, I just thank you so much, Father, for, for being a God who's with us um, and never forsakes us. It's in your name I pray, amen. Amen. Sing this with me. We fall down, we lay again as our men come forward. Fall down. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of 
Father, we just uh, praise your name and thank you for uh, being a God of uh, so much love and mercy and compassion. Lord, we just ask now that you uh, bless this offering to you and your kingdom. May it carry out the work that you've called uh, us to do and many others, Lord. Let us just uh, step up and be all you've called us to be. Guide us and strengthen us as a church body. Let us uh, be used by you. These things I pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, Bill. As they receive our offering, sing this with me. Come and fill our homes with your presence. Come fill our homes with your presence. You alone are worthy of our reverence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me, so much. All right, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, and it is time for Children's Church, and thank you all for volunteering for that. As they're leaving, uh, Matthew chapter 7, we will finish our Sermon on the Mount series this morning. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I've, in, I've, I've enjoyed it. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed walking through uh, the Sermon on the Mount together. I've, I've learned so much about what the Lord has to say to us, and I pray that, that you guys have as well. So let me read Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29 this morning. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain fell. And the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them would be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, 
and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. And so the passage before us is, is a great passage. Uh, if you'll remember, several weeks ago, uh, we started uh, his, uh, his ending of his sermon. And any good pastor starts way early and then doesn't end until later, right? And so that's what we see Jesus doing. It actually starts in verse 13. So his, his closing starts in verse 13, where he begins to tell us all about what you and I need to be doing. And he talks about the narrow gate, the wide gate the narrow gate and the broad path and the narrow path. He moves on to the two trees. If you'll remember, uh, the good tree bears good fruit and the bad tree bears bad fruit. And then we talked about uh, some other things. And then now to, today we're going to talk about the two foundations. So, so we have the, the two gates, we have the, the, the two trees, and today we have the two foundations. There literally is only two choices for you and for me to make. Either we follow Christ and we have everlasting life with Him, or we don't and we die a death, eternity all against the power of God in, in hell and forever in all eternity in a real place called, called hell, where a lot of people today don't really believe exist, and yet there's a real place called hell, and there is a real place called heaven and we have this choice to make and we have this choice to make while we are still breathing while we're still breathing this is the choice that you and I need to make and, and so what I want to make very clear uh, very clear this morning is who is the Sermon on the Mount primarily written to is it believers or non-believers Believers. It's written to believers. So the Sermon on the Mount is primarily written to believers. And, and if you'll remember, we're, uh, we started with the Beatitudes and, and we are to come poor in spirit and all of these things that we see. And then we have the pivotal passage in the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And how is it that, that our righteousness can surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees? There is only one way, and that is to have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Not this outward show, not this thing that everybody says, oh, he, he's a great Christian or she's a, a, a great Christian, she must spend a lot of time in the Word, must spend a lot of time in, in prayer. No, none of that at the end of the day matters. What matters is do we have a relationship with Jesus Christ? He's saying here in Matthew chapter 7, he's telling us that in the final day, it doesn't matter what other people think about you. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself. What matters is what is God? think about you? What does God think about you? Does he see the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, upon you? And if he does, then you may enter in to the kingdom of God. Not, not I was a great person, not I, I, I prayed all the time, not I, not I came to church every time the doors were open, not I, I walked an aisle, not that I, I, I got baptized. No. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you adhere to the word of God? And that's what we're going to see here uh, this morning. If you'll remember, I, I said this last week, the Lord is not speaking to irreligious people. He's not speaking to atheists or agnostics. He's not speaking to pagans or heretics or apostates. What he is speaking to here in Matthew chapter 7 are religious people. And you know how much I love that word, right? Oh. He's talking to religious people. He's talking to uh, your, your grandma, your aunt, and you say, hey, is your grandma a Christian? And you say, oh, she's very religious. We're talking about that person, not someone that says, no, I do not know God and I don't want anything to do with him. That's not what we're speaking about. He is speaking to those of us who look like you and me. Look just like you and me who, who come to church, who may even read the Bible who may even spend some time in prayer, and yet we are deceived. We are deceived. We're going to look at that very quickly this morning. Verse 24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them 
may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So he, he's, he's talking about, uh, therefore, which is coming off the heels of 21 through 23, which we talked about last week, which really is uh, the, the pivotal moment uh, that in 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles? And he will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You who practice lawlessness, what does your life say about you? Not, not on Sunday morning, not, not the outward appearance when we say, hey, how's everything going in your life? And you say, great, fantastic, couldn't be better, best time of my life, my marriage is great, my kids are great, everything's great, plenty of money, lots of food, big house, nice car, nothing could be better. I am the best I've ever been in all my life. That's what we say on Sunday morning. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about really, really. When you leave here, you're in the parking lot, and the argument starts back up that you stopped as soon as you open the door in the parking lot to come in. Life kicks back in the moment we walk out these doors again. That's what I'm asking you. Does that reveal a life following Jesus Christ? So he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, acts on them. Here is the big thing. Here's where we're going to take a journey through the scripture this morning. All right, so I hope you guys have your Bibles or, or you're, you're at least cheating with some sort of device here. We're going we're gonna to walk through the scriptures here. This will be the, probably the only time that we do this today, but I want to make sure that you and I understand that this is all throughout scripture. That is not a, this is not a one and done, even though out of the lips of Jesus Christ, a one and done is just fine with me. Amen. But this isn't just a one and done. He says this, those who hear these words of mine, how many have heard the words of Jesus? Every single one of you should raise your hand because we have walked through the Sermon on the Mount over the last several months, all right? So we have all heard them. So this is speaking to you and to me who hears these words of mine, everyone here. So we know that. Now he says, and acts on them. And acts on them. Here is the difference. We have all heard, but we have not all acted. We have not all acted. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 31. Turn with me, to, and I'll, I forgot, I'll turn with you. For those of you guys who were not here last week, we're doing something a little different. Yes, we are. You guys are amazing. John chapter 8, verse 31. Uh, we're doing something different, so we're not going to uh, put the verses up on the screen any longer. I want us to get familiar with the Word of God, plus one of my all-time favorite sounds in all the world, Page is turning. Isn't that a nice noise? If somebody could record that and send that to me, I could fall asleep listening to that probably. John chapter 8, verse 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Do, do you see that? He says, if. If you continue. Everybody okay with that? If we continue in his word, then we are truly disciples of his. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Verses 22 through 24. I've tried to get them in somewhat of an order so we don't have to flip flap. James chapter 1. I'm turning with you to give you some time to. I didn't even mark them myself. James chapter 1 verses 22 through 24 says this. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. You see, we've seen this in the Gospel of John. We've seen this in, in James. The idea that you and I are, are called to do something. Luke chapter 6. I won't have you turn there. It's very quick. Luke six forty six. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Turn with me to Titus chapter 1. 
Titus chapter 1, and we're going to look at uh, verses 15 and 16. Titus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. It says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good. Deed. Man, do you see this passage? Again, this is, this is it, guys. This is how he closes the Sermon on the Mount. There are two choices that you and I need to make. We have heard. Now, are we actually going to obey his word or are we going to continue on living the way that we have always lived? Something has to change. Something has to change in order for us to follow Christ. We cannot take all of our problems, all of the things of this world, all the things and the baggage that we have attained and make it through the narrow gate that Jesus Christ has called us to. We must come, as, as the Beatitudes say, pure, pure in heart and poor in spirit. Poor in in spirit, to know that there is nothing that we can do to attain it and everything to gain. Last one, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. If you've been with us in the evenings, you've been turning to 1 Peter, just go a little bit further. 1 John chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 3 through 7. He says this. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 7, he says this, By this we know that we have come to know him. How, how do we know? How do you and I know for a fact that we have come to know Jesus Christ if we keep his commandments? The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments, he is a, he is a liar. So what the Word of God says. He is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. He said, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the what? It is the word. It is the word which you have heard. You see, how do we know that we are truly followers of Jesus Christ? How, how, how do we know? And I'm cutting, and I, I, told, I told Tom and I told uh, Dave this morning I was going to do this, and, I, and I'm doing it. I was going to go from my opening to my conclusion in a matter of seconds and then forget all the middle, but I'm doing it anyways. But it comes down to this. It comes down to this. How do we know that we are a true follower of Jesus Christ? How, how do we know that we are part of the kingdom of God? Do we desire the word and do we desire to obey the Word of God? Do we desire the Word? And do we desire to obey the Word of God? It's not enough to come on Sunday morning. It's not enough to come on Sunday night. It's not enough to come on Wednesday night. What he cares about and what he has always cared about, and what we see through all of Scripture, is not the outward sign. If we haven't learned that from this Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't care about all the things from the outward appearance. What he cares about is our heart. Our heart. Does our heart belong to Jesus Christ? Does our heart belong to Jesus Christ? Or, or are we like, a, like the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 2? So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Why do we do what we do? Do we care about Christ or do we just want to be noticed by people? Do we just want people to say, oh, he, they must be a, a, a big believer. They must be really, really in the word of God. But are you truly, are you truly part of the kingdom of God? He says this in verse 24, going back. Let's see if we can't finish this up. 
He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. All right, so what we have here, this is a, the word that literally means bedrock. It's not one single rock. This is someone who dug down all the way until they have a, a, a pile of bedrock. And then what they do is they build their house on this bedrock, the solid foundation of bedrock, which is the word of God. All right, everybody's, everybody's okay with this. This is the word of God. And he says in verse 25, And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the what? On the rock, which is the Word of God. It had been founded on the rock, which is the Word of God. And let me ask you, over the last week, over the last month, how many times have you been founded in the Word of God? How many times have your family members seen you in the Word of God? How many of you have led your families in the Word of God? How many of you have, have spoken outside of church realm about the Word of God? You see, do we love the Word of God? Do we desire the Word of God? And do we desire to obey what the Word of God has to say to us? What is it that our houses are founded on? What is it that our lives are founded on? And, and most men would say our jobs. We'd say our jobs. Our, our life is founded on our jobs. Because that's how we've always been defined. Not our families, not the Word of God, not our relationship with Christ, not our spouse, but our jobs. A lot of women would say their jobs or their children would define who they are. Not the Word of God, not their spouse. And we wonder why this world is so terrible. It's because of us. <laughs> Sorry. It's because of us. It's because we have fallen away from the truth. We have, been, we have been lied to and we have caught into the lie that says all you have to do is walk an aisle, fill out a card, get wet, and you will be saved and everything's going to be hunky-dory. But that's not right. That's not what we see in the Word of God. That's not what we see in the Word of God. That's not what we see in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and so then in verse uh, uh, 25, uh, the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against the house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. This storm, all right, just so everybody knows, so the rock is the word of God, just so everybody's good. This storm is when you and I have died and we are in heaven and Jesus says, I mean, I said this last week, I remember, I think, why should I let you in? And we have all these things that we make up. It is all about the blood of Jesus Christ. But this is the final judgment for us. This is, this is Jesus. This is God saying, when, when the winds blow and slams against your house, everything is shaken up. You have died. This is all eternity at stake. We're not, we're not here to, to talk about what does your family say about you. We're not here to talk about, you know, what does your wife say about you? What, is, what does your job say about you? We're here to say, what does the word of God or what does God have to say about you? What does God have to say about you? In verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So what we have, we have on one hand, we have the, the wise man who builds his house. Literally, his foundation is built on the word of God. The decisions that he makes are founded and rooted in the word of God. And then we have the opposite. We have the foolish person. Well, the foolish person is always in a hurry. His first desire is to please himself. He takes the shortest route to that end. And in church work, he wants the quick and easy solution. The one that causes the least controversy and hassle. With no consideration of how the solution may square with scripture. He is for easy evangelism. He is for easy discipleship because they bring quick results that are simple to see and to measure. He has no time for searching the word for the right truth with which to witness or for soul searching or sound conviction or sound 
doctrine. He sees a verbal profession. He sees a card signed, a prayer prayed as sufficient to bring a person to Christ. He is perfectly willing to declare a person saved without his having any awareness that he is actually lost. Far too many people say they come to Christ and they never knew they were lost. We have to get better. We have to get better at living out what we say we believe. In this parable, the sower of Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, we'll, we'll turn there just because it's a couple pages over. Matthew chapter 13 is a famous parable that everybody knows. Uh, once, you, once you read it, you'll, you'll remember what it is. But Matthew chapter 13, picking up in verse 20. We'll just read verses 20 and 21. It says this. Uh, again, this is uh, the sower explained. Uh, it's it's the, the one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places. This is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction... Or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. You see these two words of immediately in these two passages. He immediately accepts the word of God and he immediately falls away. This is the foolish man. He likes the promises of God, but he doesn't like the requirements that go along with it. He likes the, the promises of God, the promises that say abundant life, that says we, we may have a life uh, everlasting. Those are great promises from God. I won't even get into the, 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 the verses that we use that are out of context that we like to use about prosperous and those sort of things. But, but we like the promises of God, but we don't really like the requirements of God. We don't really like the obedience of God. If you remember 1 John, what we talked about, right? 1 John, this isn't me. By this we know that we, have com that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments, he is a, he is a liar. He is a liar. That's what the word of God says, not me. So we see here the contrast between the wise man who builds his house on the rock, who, who literally takes the time in the parallel passage in Luke to say he digs deep, digs deep into the word of God, digs deep into the truths of God. He digs deep into his relationship with God. And the opposite of that would be this foolish man who always wants something easy. Easy. Yes, I want to be freed from my addiction, but I don't want to put anything into it. Yes, I want to be freed from sin, but I just want it to be like a magic potion. Yes, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, but I really just want to walk an aisle at some church and then never come back. Uh, what I want is something that's extremely easy because, after all, we live in a very easy world, don't we? We're all in a huff if we don't get our Big Mac in three minutes. Everybody okay with that? Right? We have to nuke something. Nuke. Is that okay? A microwave. Everybody nukes it. Is that okay? We're microwaving something that takes like four minutes and we're all upset that something takes four minutes in the microwave. What takes four minutes in the microwave? Baked potato. Thank you very much, Ronald. Appreciate that, brother. You're here for me baked potato. All right. You and I must not always be looking for the easy way. We must not always be looking for the easy way. Verse 27, he says, the rain fell, the flood slammed against that house, and it fell. And then he says, and great, great was its fall. Here's what I want to point out to you very quickly, and then we'll, we'll conclude uh, this morning. Very quickly, I want to point out some some truths here. What we have is, is two men. We have two men uh, in this passage. One, one is wise and one is foolish. But on the outside, they look the same. They look the exact same uh, as, as anyone else. These are two men who look identical. These are two men who wanted the same thing. They wanted a house. 
They wanted a house. They wanted security for themselves and their family. Not only did they want a house, but they wanted a house in relatively the same part of town because we see that, that the rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew, the storm hit the same houses. So not only do we have two men who look identical with two identical houses made from the same material, the only difference between these two is the foundation. The foundation. What is your God. What are you living for? Is it yourself? Is it your stuff? Is it the things of this world? You know, and, and we're in church, and, and so obviously all of us sitting here will say, no, we live for Jesus. We're here on a Sunday morning. We, we live for Jesus. Even most of us brought our Bible. I mean, we, we live for for Jesus, what more do you want? I, I got up early on a Sunday. I, I came to church. I brought my Bible. I even got dressed up a little bit. I, I even took a shower last week, right? Yeah. What more do you want? Well, the, the Word of God says, what is it that your foundation is built on? What is it that you devote your time, talents, and attention to? Is it the Word of God or is it the things of this world? C.S. Lewis says this. He gives a remarkable illustration. Uh, he says, when I was a child, I often had a toothache. And I knew that if I went to my mother, she would give me something which would deaden the pain for that night and let me sleep. But I did not want to go to my mother, at least not until the pain became very bad. And the reason I did not go was this. I did not doubt she would give me the aspirin, but I knew she would also do something else. I knew she would take me to the dentist the next morning. I could not get what I wanted out of her without getting something more, which I did not want. I wanted immediate relief from pain, but I could not get it without having my teeth set permanently right. And I knew those dentists, I knew they started fiddling about with all sorts of other teeth which had not yet begun to ache. They would not let sleeping dogs lie. It's kind of interesting, but the very sort of thinking that keeps many people out of the kingdom of God is the price is more than they want to pay. The cost is far too high. When the winds blow, when the rain falls, when the flood comes, when the world attacks us and things of this world, will we stand? Will we stand? Because we have built our life on the truths of the Word of God. Or will we be another statistic like we read all over the news that another pastor has fallen or this person has fallen or this person has fallen or this person no longer walks with God? Because when the floods came, when the winds blew, they said, I've had enough. They were not founded on the rock. They were not founded on the word of God. Lewis goes on and he says this, the imagined words of Christ. He says, you have free will, and if you choose, you can push me away. But if you do not push me away, understand that I am going to see this job through. I will never rest, nor let you rest, until you are literally perfect. Until my Father can say without reservation that he is well pleased with you, as he said he was well pleased with me. Will our Heavenly Father, on that day, when we pass from this life to the next, will he say, that he is pleased with us. Will he say, good job? Or will he say, depart from me? I never knew you. Lastly, Luke chapter 17, verse 10 says this. So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Meaning this, 
meaning this. If our life is built on the foundation of the word of God, we will not be like the Pharisees. We will not be like the Pharisees that say, look at what I have done for the kingdom. Look at me. Look at all the things I've given. Look at all the things I've done. Look at me. Look at me. No, we would be like Luke 17, 10, say we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Jesus Christ gets all the honor and all the glory for he paid the price for you and for me. So I ask you, and I, and I am done this morning, what is your life built on? What is your life built on? Try to take your mind out of this context of church. Because on a Sunday morning, we all want to say what our foundation is made of. But let's think about last week, last Thursday, last Friday, two months ago, whatever. Look on your life over the last several weeks what is your foundation built on? Is it truly the word of God? You see, because God wants our hearts. He desires our hearts. He wants a relationship with you and with me. He doesn't want our lip service. Let's pray together this morning. Father, as we have concluded your your words to us, God, as we have dove deep into your words on the side of the mountain, as we have shown, as you have revealed to us in your word, the truths about your word, God, we see over and over and over again that we are unworthy, that we are not worthy, but we know the one who is. That our righteousness has to surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And the only way that that happens is a true relationship with you. When your righteousness covers our sins. When God looks upon us with your blood with your redemption with your redeeming power God I ask that we would focus just for the next few seconds on our life truly focus upon our lives what is our lives built on are they built around our jobs, our family, the world? Or are they built on the truths of your word? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.